Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to start a new focus of my channel. It's mostly going to be over on Common Sense Science, but I'm debuting this on Bob the Science Guy to just kind of introduce you to it. You know, for the last few months, I've seen a lot of people in the debunking community talk about astronomy. Wolfie6020 is an avid amateur astronomer, and I've always been kind of interested in it. So when I heard about a used Celestron 5-inch refractor telescope coming up for 75 bucks, I went and checked it out and bought it. And I've had a lot of very interesting evenings out looking at the moon and looking at the planets and the stars. I'm learning the constellations in the sky, and it's turning out to be an awesome hobby. So I thought I'd share that with you a little bit. Since I couldn't go out and do any stargazing today, it's raining, I decided to have a look at the German Equatorial Mount, which you see right here. A lot of people don't understand how equatorial mounts on telescopes work, so I thought I'd go through it with you real quick. So let's cue up the music and get going. Now to set up an equatorial mount, the first thing that you have to do is you have to align the telescope with the North Star, but that's going to be the subject of another video. Let's just assume for the point of this video that that is the direction to the North Star and the telescope is pointed exactly to it. We have two adjustment knobs here. The first one has to do with the angle of declination. Now there's a concentric grid system in the evening sky, much like those lines on the bottom of the bowl. The North Star is located at 90 degrees. If we wish to see a star that is below the North Star, we can move the telescope in this axis. So again, the North Star is here at 90 degrees. If we move the declination wheel, that moves it to farther and farther circles away from the North Star. But say the distance between these two coins is 30 degrees. The distance all along this blue line is 30 degrees off the North Star. So to understand what's going on, let's go ahead and have a quick look at a program called Stellarium. Now it's a free program and there'll be a link to it in the description. So go ahead and download this thing and play with it a little bit. So here we are. We've got Alma, Michigan, which is pretty close to me, and we're looking north. Now let's go ahead and do a couple of things with this. First of all, let's get rid of the ground. And this tells us exactly the sun is setting right now. The moon is not yet risen. Here's north. Well, let's go ahead and get rid of the sky. And here are the positions of all the stars. Now, if we look up a little bit, like so, and we go ahead and turn the constellations on. Now, here's a constellation called Ursa Major, the Big Bear. And this part of it, I grew up calling the Big Dipper. Some people in Europe call it the plow or the cart. So if you look at these two stars in the cup of the dipper and go about five times that distance away, you're going to see another star in the constellation Ursa Minor, the little bear. And this is Polaris, or the North Star. Now let's go ahead and have a quick look at the grid system that we use. We're going to use the equatorial grid system. And there it is. You see how it's centered on Polaris, and Polaris is at 90 degrees. Then we go out to a ring that's 80 degrees, 70, and 60. Now when we look at the equatorial mount, we have two controls on it. One is called the declination, and it starts off at 90 degrees, and then starts coming down, and if I set it to 80, the telescope will be pointing at something on this circle. Now down here, I'd be pointing at 60 degrees and it would be on this big circle. Now let's go ahead and bring this in a little bit more. So there's Polaris. Now down here we have something called the constellation Cassiopeia. And it's a big W that's in the sky. And you see it's got these five stars in it. There are more than five stars in this constellation, but these five stars give us this nice W shape, and they're very easy to see in the night sky. 
If we look at this star, for example, calf, you'll see right up here, it's at about 60 degrees. Actually, a little bit less, because this is the 60 degree mark right here. But what about these side marks? These are called the right ascension marks. And this particular one is the prime meridian, so to say, of the celestial sphere. There are a total of 24 of these, and they're about 15 degrees apart. Now, this star will go all the way around this circle and end up coming back to this position in 24 hours. Since this is the prime meridian of the celestial sphere, if we look right up here, we see that it is about 9 minutes and 11 seconds beyond the zero hour mark. Now, if we go out to this one right here, Navy, you'll see it also is at about 60 degrees. This time it's just a little bit above it. And it is one hour after calf. And if we look right up here, you'll see it says 56 minutes, 47 seconds. That's because it's just a little bit on this side of the line. Now, the first thing that we do to align the equatorial mount is we point this telescope and lock it in on Polaris. And that's at 90 degrees. Now, if I want to go down and have a look at Navi, I'll bring it down to 60 degrees, and it'll come out here maybe. Then what I have to do is I have to turn the right declination and bring it around this circle until I get to about one hour. And that's how we find stars in the sky. And as you can see from this, we can plot them very precisely down to the tenth of a second. Now while I have this up, let's go ahead and have a look at something interesting. Okay, so here we have the North Star, and here we have the constellation Cassiopeia. Now, we can go over here, and we can change the time. So let's go back to 2019, and go to December 1st. We'll bring this out of the way a little bit. Now here's the North Star. It hasn't moved because it's in the center of our system. And here's Cassiopeia up here at about the 12 o'clock position. Now over the course of a year, that constellation will move a complete circle in 12 months. So in December, if it's at the 12 o'clock position, where will it be in January? At about 11 o'clock. February, 10 o'clock, March, 9 o'clock. Well, let's see if we can put this all into action. Let's go back to Stellarium. We'll turn off the ground. We'll turn off the sky. And we'll go ahead and put our grid back up. So there's Polaris. And let's go ahead and bring in some constellations. So let's find a nice target. Let's go back over here to Cassiopeia. So here we have the star Rukba. Now, first that we, the first thing that we need to do is we need to figure out about how far it is from Polaris. So we're going to go, this is 80, this is 70, and there's 60. And then we'll figure out how many hours it is from the prime meridian. So the very first thing that we would need to do to find this star is to get out onto this 60 degree ring. Let's go back to the telescope and see how we do that with the German equatorial mount. Now once again, let's go over the parts of the mount. Here's the barrel of the mount. This is aligned with the North Star. This barrel needs to face north and south, and it's set to my approximate latitude, which is about 45 degrees. We'll actually get this outside and zero it on Polaris on another video. Now up here, we have our declination knob. Currently it's set at 90 degrees. But say we want to bring this down to about 60 degrees. Let's go ahead and see how to do that. So what we'll do is we'll loosen up the lock and we'll swing the declination to about 60 degrees. Now, once we've set the declination to 60 degrees, we're just out on that circle, somewhere on that circle. We're not at our star yet. In order to get to our star, we need to use the right ascension gear and bring it around the circle 
until our telescope meets up with a star. And this is the right ascension gear. So let me show you what happens when we adjust that. Now here we're adjusting the telescope along that 60 degree arc until we come to our star. Once we find the star, we'll go ahead and lock it back in place. Now the telescope is locked onto the star itself. And all we need to do is we need to turn that right ascension knob to make fine adjustments to keep tracking the star as it goes across the sky in response to the rotation of the Earth beneath it. Now one thing that bears mentioning is that the Celestron 127 EQ is an excellent telescope for a beginning astronomer such as myself. It's less than $200. It's a five inch reflector telescope that gathers enough light to enable me to not only see the moon, I can see Jupiter, Neptune, Saturn, I can make out the rings in Saturn, and I can even see some deep space objects like the Andromeda Galaxy. So while it's a well-made telescope and has good precision for less than $500, including all accessories, it's not a $20,000 computer-controlled, high-quality, research-grade telescope. Even though the stars themselves, their locations are measured with a micrometer, so to say, this telescope marks that measurement with chalk. So these dials are not designed to let you go straight to the address of the star and have it immediately appear in your viewfinder. It's designed to get you in the neighborhood. Uh, on a low power viewfinder, the star will probably appear in your field of view. It's up to you to completely center it from there and then go up in power until you can actually make out some detail. My telescope is manually driven. It teaches me a tremendous amount about telescopes though. Perhaps someday Wolfie and I'll have a talk about telescopes. But for now, if you're interested in this hobby, that Celestron 127 is a good choice. You can generally find them used. I bought mine for 75 bucks. Now that's not any sort of a paid endorsement for Celestron. It's just a good telescope and I'm making my recommendation to you. Now hopefully in the future we'll do some more videos on backyard astronomy. There's many things that I would like to go over. How do you polar align an equatorial mount? That's a video in itself. How do you collimate the mirrors to get your path of light all lined up using a laser collimator? That's another great video. Another thing that I would like to do is I'd like to give everybody a tour of the moon so you could tell the difference between the seas. You'd see where the Apollo landing sites were. You'd identify some of the major craters. We can do that one day. I have a mount on this telescope that allows me to hook this camera up to it. Sometime this summer, I'll have some adapters that'll even let me use some eyepieces with it. So there's a lot that we're gonna do with astronomy in the next few months, and I'm really looking forward to it. In medicine, we have a saying, and that is, see one, do one, teach one. So I watched a lot of YouTube videos on how to do this. Then I went out and I did it myself. Now, I'm showing you how to do it. This is all helping me learn, and hopefully it'll help you learn a little bit too. So in the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by and for your support of the channel. Remember, I have another channel now called Common Sense Science. There's a link to it in the description. That's going to be mostly science-related stuff. Now, on Bob the Science Guy, I'm going to continue doing my debunks and get back to the roots of the channel. I have a lot of interest in doing science and medicine topics, too, and they'll be over on Common Sense Science. The playlists will be shared between the two channels. And if you're on this channel, you'll be able to see what's over there. If you're over there, you'll be able to see what's on this channel. And I'm looking forward to expanding that over the summer. So in the meantime, remember to hit that like and subscribe. Go over to Common Sense Science, hit the like and subscribe over there while you're at it. And I'll see you again soon.